This is the true story of Larry Hoover, the gang leader who grew his organization to 30,000 members, in multiple states, and helped them sell more than $100 million in drugs per year, from prison. Born on November 30, 1950, in Jackson, Mississippi, Larry Hoover moved to Chicago, Illinois, with his family when he was four years old. He was just 12 or 13 when he joined a local gang called the Supreme Gangsters. Hoover started out with smaller crimes like theft, but he eventually graduated to more violent offenses like shootings. He also made a name for himself as a natural leader, and he took control of the gang by the time he was 15. As the years went on, Hoover allied with a number of former rivals to form a super gang of about 1,000 members. He also changed the name of his organization a few times. By the late 1960s, the Black Gangster Disciple Nation, better known as Gangster Disciples, was firmly set in stone. Though one of Hoover's allies, David Barksdale, was initially named the leader of the group, Barksdale was injured in a shooting in 1969. Since Barksdale was in no condition to lead, Hoover took control of the organization yet again. Before long, the gangster disciples controlled the drug trade on Chicago's south side, and profits soared to over $1,000 per day. But Hoover's criminal activities and notoriety would soon catch up with him. In 1973, Hoover was sentenced to 150 to 200 years in prison, for ordering the murder of a dealer named William Young. On the surface, it seemed as though Hoover's criminal career had come to an end, and that Barksdale would resume leadership after he recovered from his wounds. But by the next year, Barksdale had died from kidney failure related to the shooting, supposedly leaving the gangster disciples without a leader. Meanwhile, Larry Hoover was becoming ever more powerful behind bars. Sent to the Maximum Security Stateville Correctional Center in Crest Hill, Illinois, Larry Hoover made a name for himself there in a positive way. Not only did he offer protection to other inmates, but he also impressed the prison staff members by discouraging violence in the facility. Guards were relieved to see that the number of fights and uprisings had gone down, and they soon began to see Hoover as a positive influence on other prisoners. But when the guards' backs were turned, Hoover was recruiting many of these inmates to join his gang. Hoover also stayed in touch with many members of the gang who were still working on the outside. And he encouraged his followers to move up in the world however they could. According to the insiders, he even made education mandatory for all of his followers. Many people from the outside were just as impressed as the prison staff. They hoped that Hoover's good deeds would be enough to make him a free man, especially when he changed his group's name yet again. Claiming that prison was reforming him, Larry Hoover changed the name of the gangster disciples to Growth and Development. Instead of encouraging illegal activities, this new group would promote social causes. Growth and Development funded a voter registration organization and opened a music label that donated proceeds to needy children. Soon, Hoover was the leader of a very different enterprise. He ran a clothing line, organized peaceful protests to protect publicly funded programs, and even encouraged his members to run for office. Though Hoover remained behind bars, authorities eventually rewarded his reforms with a transfer to a minimum security prison in Vienna, Illinois. From there, Hoover was able to meet privately with friends and family. He also wore luxurious clothing and jewelry and enjoyed much better food. But Hoover's public reform hid a growing criminal empire. As he applied for parole in the 1990s, Hoover was secretly running a massive drug empire that counted up to 30,000 members, according to the Chicago Sun-Times. The gangster disciples had clearly expanded far beyond Chicago, counting soldiers in multiple states, especially in the Midwest and Southeast. At one point, the gang was selling over $100 million in drugs per year. In 1995, a massive raid on the gangster disciples led to the arrests of 22 members, including Larry Hoover. Carried out by over 250 federal, state, and local authorities, this raid was called Operation Headache. The raid took place at the end of a five-year undercover investigation. Apparently, some authorities had become suspicious of Hoover's rehabilitation over time. So they decided to investigate, wiretapping Hoover in prison, seeking out potential informants, and searching offices that were linked to the organization. Ultimately, they said that gangster disciples had never really stopped operating as a criminal enterprise. After Hoover was indicted on drug conspiracy charges, he was relocated to a facility in Chicago for his trial. 
In 1997, he was found guilty of the charges and given six life sentences, in addition to the 200-year sentence that he was already serving for the murder he ordered back in the 1970s. Following the guilty verdict, Hoover was transferred to ADX Florence, a federal supermax prison in Colorado that houses some of the world's most notorious criminals, including El Chapo and the Unabomber. While many authorities praised this decision, not everyone was happy with it. Since Larry Hoover had tens of thousands of loyal followers by the time he was caught running the gang from prison, it's not surprising that many of them would like to see him get his freedom. But Hoover also counts many people as supporters who have never been part of the organization. Some ordinary citizens, especially in Chicago, see Hoover as an inspiration because of his promotion of community service and empowerment. His emphasis on education and his public discouragement of violence also touched many. Though Hoover's followers didn't always align with those values, Hoover's supporters still insist that his heart was in the right place. Perhaps the most famous supporter of Larry Hoover is the rapper Yee, previously known as Kanye West. In 2021, West even collaborated with fellow rapper Drake for a free Larry Hoover benefit concert at the Los Angeles Coliseum. Earlier that year, Hoover had tried to appeal his sentence, but a judge refused, calling him one of the most notorious criminals in Illinois history. While the benefit concert didn't change Hoover's status in prison, he has not given up on getting his freedom. Now in his early 70s, he's taking another look at his options for release, even though it's looking unlikely. According to the Chicago Sun-Times, Hoover even renounced his former gang and made a rare public statement that he is no longer the Larry Hoover described by the government.